So for example, if you're a foreign portfolio investor, you can freely bring in money and take it out. For you, there is no constraint on capital account convertibility, right? But if I'm a domestic company, then there is a constraint as to how much capital I can take out to invest uh, offshore. And so Neeraj, uh, how, how do central banks think about uh, the exchange rate itself? So as an example, how does the RBI think about the rupee and is a depreciating rupee better or an appreciating rupee better or you know many times you hear this right like oh our exchange rate has depreciated it is uh, bad for the country or whatever so so how do central banks think about it that excessive demand for foreign currency is resulting in a depreciation of local currency uh, then the central bank has to step in and provide the foreign currency to balance the market, right? This is basically a direct intervention in the market. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Open Dialogue. In the last episode, we spoke about the foreign exchange market. We will continue our conversation today, speak about various exchange rate regimes and how central banks think about and manage the foreign exchange uh, levels. Uh, joining me today is Neeraj Gambhir. So Neeraj, uh, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, how you know central banks manage the forex uh, of, of every country. Uh, and so maybe we can start with just explaining different types of uh, exchange rate regimes that exist around the world. So there are basically three variants. Uh, number one is what we call as floating. Floating means it's fully market determined. The market determines the value of one currency against the other currency, depending upon the cash flows or the, you know, the money flows that are happening as we discussed in the previous episode. The second is what we call as a peg, which is basically a fixed linkage between one currency and the second currency. One example, Hong Kong dollar is a peg to US dollar. Right. So the exchange rate between Hong Kong dollar and US dollar is fixed at all points in time, no matter what happens to the underlying demand and supply. The third, which is basically an intermediate, is what we call as a float or a partial float. It is in some senses market determined floating, but there is a very strong influence of the central bank in the market and the central bank decides how the currency's exchange rate moves over a period of time using very tools and various tools and techniques that they have. Most of the major developing economies, such as India, China, even countries like Brazil, Mexico, they have some form of shape of partial floats, managed, float. managed floats or partial floats. They're called managed floats because the, it's a float. There is a market in which the exchange rate is getting determined but there is a very strong influence of the central bank or of the government uh, in determining the value of the exchange rate. Understood. And so again, just to kind of, uh, just to put it in my words again, so at one extreme you have free for all, like anybody can come buy, sell the exchange, uh, the, the forex and move on. The central bank is a, is a observer, but not necessarily a great part, like a significant participant. That's right. On the other extreme, you have a central bank which is saying, doesn't matter what happens, my exchange rate to the dollar is fixed. Yeah. And so, if somebody comes and sells more dollars, then I will buy those. And if somebody is selling more of, let's say, the Hong Kong dollar, then I will sell forex and buy kind of, you know, yeah. uh, bring stability to the market. So, I will ensure that the uh, rate remains fixed. And then there are there are kind of many people who are in between, which is I guess the managed float, wherein they are saying, look, let there be a market, but if the market does something uh, which I don't like, then I will come in and intervene, right? What about the, there are also, so this is a market uh, uh, management, right? There is also, as an example, the rupee is what they call partially convertible, which means uh, you are not legally allowed to take money outside of India, let's say, or yeah. uh, bring money in. So, what about that? Yeah. So, uh, convertibility and how the value of the currency is determined are two different aspects, sure. right? Uh, what we talked about, a peg, you could have a fully convertible currency yet a peg. Right. Right? So, 
market, the, the determination of exchange rate between the two currencies and who is allowed to do what in the exchange market are therefore the differentiators, right? right? So convertibility is basically who is allowed to do what in the exchange rate market. Right. There is all forms of convertibility. Nothing is 100% convertible. No currency is 100% convertible. There are some currencies which are far more convertible than there are some other currencies where there is a very limited convertibility. Right. So effectively, the central bank or the government is saying that for X, Y, Z reasons, you can convert local currency into a foreign currency, but for A, B, C reasons, you cannot freely convert. And if you do want to do that, come to us. We will tell you whether you should do it or not do it. Right. Right. The concept of convertibility is basically divided between what is called a current account convertibility and capital account convertibility, right? The current account convertibility is that if you're buying consumption items, if you're buying goods and services for the purpose of consumption, which are what is called a current account items, you can freely go ahead and, you know, buy and sell foreign exchange for that. That's called current account convertibility. And India has current account convertibility effectively for most of the stuff, except for some items which are, say, prohibited or negative list items. The second... Which means as an individual or as a company, if you are buying something, you can basically buy or sell dollars yeah. or whatever other currency. Yeah. So that is allowed, except obviously kind of you're doing some uh, wrong... Yeah, I mean, for example, you know, certain items are prohibited to be imported. Sure. So yeah. you cannot you basically, you, uh, you cannot yeah. buy. But for most of the other stuff, for day-to-day -day stuff, you can actually... Uh, buy foreign exchange freely in the market. Right. Right. And as an individual, let's say, for example, if you're traveling abroad and nowadays when you're ordering something online using your credit card, you're effectively freely allowed to convert uh, in some senses that, you know, the, the currency. So that's all current account convertibility domain. The second aspect of this is the capital account convertibility, where if you are buying or investing abroad or if you are buying assets abroad, for that, whether you are allowed to convert or not. And most eco developing economies have some or the other form of a constraint on capital account convertibility. So for example, as an individual, if I have to, if let's say tomorrow I, 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 I want to buy a Microsoft or a Google or a Facebook shares, Meta shares, can I freely buy it? Answer is no. Hmm. There is a limit. In our context, it is called LRS, Liberalized Remittance Scheme. Uh, and you know, within that, there is a quota up to which you can do that. But you're not fully convertible in that sense. So this is, there is a constraint on how much of foreign exchange you can buy for the purpose of investing abroad. Or say, for example, if I want to buy a house in Florida and US, can I freely go and buy it? Answer is no. There is a, there is a constraint on that. So effectively, today in India, we have largely um, uh, current account convertibility. We have most constraints on capital account convertibility. And the capital account convertibility constraints also vary between different kinds of players. Right. So for example, if you're a foreign portfolio investor, you can freely bring in money and take it out. For you, there is no constraint on capital account convertibility. Right. But if I'm a domestic company, then there is a constraint as to how much capital I can take out to invest. Uh, offshore, right? Uh, similarly, as an individual, there is a constraint on how much can I actually take out uh, for investing abroad for buying, you know, uh, 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 whether I'm investing in equities or fixed income or real estate and stuff like that, right? There is a varying degree of constraints on each of the market players or economic actors, as we call it, uh, on how much you're allowed to do from a capital perspective. Great. Fantastic. So we'll, we'll come back to this notion again in a bit. Uh, but let me go back to the first part, which is the uh, managed float and so on and so forth. And there, if you can elaborate a little bit on, you know, in many of these cases, the central bank is uh, managing, quote unquote, the foreign exchange rate. So how do they do that? What are the tools that they have to, to manage a foreign exchange rate? Yeah, so effectively, uh, one, I mean, let's look at the idea of the fact that there is a market for foreign exchange, and that market is operating on its own, right? But the market is influenced by the demand and supply, and it's also influenced by various factors, right? And therefore, there are times when there can be excessive movements in the exchange rates, and the central bank 
for variety of reasons may not like to have those excessive movements or it may have a view as to how much you know changes in the exchange rate it is willing to tolerate. So if it does not then effectively it has to step in and buy and sell right. So if there is more demand let us say if there is more demand for foreign currency uh, and that excessive demand for foreign currency is resulting in a depreciation of local currency uh, then the central bank has to step in and provide the foreign currency to balance the market. Right. This is basically a direct intervention in the market where the central bank steps in as a participant, he is either a buyer or he is a seller depending upon what the market conditions are. If the market has excessive demand, you sell. If the market has excessive supply of foreign currency, you buy. Right. Now to be able to do that, a central bank needs to have reserves right? because if I do not have reserves, then the how am I going to take care of? Yeah. Uh, the excessive demand that may happen, right? And invariably, in the in the emerging market economies, you end up in a situation where there is excessive demand, then excessive supply of foreign currencies. Many a times, you may not have sufficient reserves, right? And the market may be excessively on one side, particularly in the scenario where the currency is weakening a lot. And in that case, what you do is you basically then start restricting. A, either the participants who can buy and sell or the purpose for which you can buy and sell. Right. Right. So, at the heart of managing a managed floating exchange rate regime is intervention by the central bank coupled with what we call as capital controls if the intervention or the size of reserves is not good enough for you to be able to manage the market. So, it is a combination of these two things. Understood. So, Neeraj, uh, does then a uh, fully floating currency mean that there is no intervention by the central bank? For most part, yes, there is no intervention in the central bank. But there can be instances and situations, though it happens very rarely, that a central bank is forced to intervene even if the you know currency is fully convertible and it is a fully exchange rate, fully market driven exchange rate. Take the case in point of Japanese yen now. It has depreciated to 150 yen to a dollar mm -hmm. uh, over the last, I think, about 18 to 24 months. This has been a very rapid depreciation of JPY. And there is this expectation that if yen was to depreciate a lot and it is already reaching the threshold where there could be a potential for uh, Bank of Japan to intervene and stem the uh, pace of depreciation of the market, right? There have been very few instances uh, in the recent history, say about last 20, 30 years, where Bank of Japan has intervened in the market. So when something like this happens, it is a rare instance that Bank of Japan has intervened and that has a big influence on the markets, but it is not impossible, right? Uh, for most part, for a very large period of time, it can be a fully market driven, you know, exchange rate uh, establishment that can happen. Understood. And so Neeraj, uh, how, how do central banks think about uh, the exchange rate itself? So as an example, how does the RBI think about uh, the rupee uh, and is a depreciating rupee better or an appreciating rupee better or you know many times you hear this right like oh our exchange rate has depreciated it is uh, bad for the country or whatever. So, so how do central banks think about it? See, in some senses, it is a price, a currency exchange rate is a price, right? Uh, and depending upon how the price is set, it will have an impact on the uh, demand and supply of the goods right. uh, in the economy, right? So take the example if, let us say, in some theoretical sense, an ex a currency is overvalued, which means that it is very richly priced as compared to where it should be. Uh, given the underlying demand and supply conditions. What you will tend to see is a lot of imports yep. happening in the country, right? So there is going to be more imports. That more imports coming in from outside will have an impact on the amount of production that can be done domestically, right? Uh, and therefore, the price of the currency can have a significant impact 
on the domestic in the economic activity, right? So what the central banks would ideally like to do is make sure two things. One is the price or the exchange rate is set in such a way that it does not negatively impact the domestic economy, right? It is in some senses a very fair exchange rate uh, depending upon various economic you know, parameters. The second is that there is not or, or rather the exchange rate markets are well behaved. What tends to happen and this is more of a price effect which can have a you know a, a sort of a self-sustaining uh, sort of vicious cycle is that if a currency is depreciating at a very rapid pace, it can erode outsiders' confidence in an economy, right? So in that sense, the value of the currency is also seen as some sort of a barometer of the health of an economy. And obviously, when the central banks are thinking about the price of a currency, they also want to make sure that the external view of the economy is good and it is not sort of uh, negative in some senses. So the management of currency objectives can be multiple, but predominantly it can be to make sure that the value of the currency or exchange rate is aligned to economic parameters. And second, there is not excessive volatility in a currency, uh, which can then create a very vicious self-fulfilling negative feedback loop for the economy. So I think these are the two broad areas where central banks tend to focus on. Sure. So in just going back to your the first point you made, uh, if I am in manufacturer, let us say in India, and if the rupee value is low, which means that for one dollar I can get higher number of rupees, let us say it falls, then earlier I was getting, let us say, just hypothetically, I was getting 80 rupees uh, for a dollar, now I will get 85 rupees for a dollar. So basically my exports become more competitive because I can, you know, instead of selling it at a dollar, maybe I can sell it at 95 cents and still make the same profit margins. So I get benefited by a weaker currency. On the other hand, if I am an importer, then you know a weaker currency becomes more expensive for me, and so imports become more expensive. And you know, so this dynamic is what central banks will try to to manage. Yeah. So I think uh, remember, I mean, a very weak currency, while it will be good for exports, it will be bad for imports. Absolutely. Right? Now many a times we are actually importing for exporting. Yes. Right. Uh, I gave the example of oil crude oil, right, yeah. and gems and jewelry. So what you need to f keep in mind is that if you sustain uh, a very weak currency for a very long period of time, uh, while you are encouraging exports, you are also actually encouraging exports at the cost of domestic consumption. Yep. It might be good to give you a short-term boost in the economy, but then you become too much export dependent for your economic activity. Yep. Uh, so there are there are trade-offs to be done over a shorter Absolutely. and longer period of time. And I guess uh, what I hear you say is that you can never, there is a fundamental economic strength, you try to deviate, something else will, will, will play out, right? So, and so finally you have to kind of come back to, that's right. to that level. So I think which is where I am saying that eventually you might actually try and have a very, you know, very cheap currency in some senses or very weak currency uh, for some period of time, but you can't sustain it for a long period of time. Yep. And vice versa, if you have a very strong currency, it will kill your domestic industry and it will have, you will have a lot of import substitution happening. Sure. But consumption will be given a boost. Sure. Right. So, which is why I think the central banks over a longer period of time tend to make sure that the value of the currency and there is a notion of what is a fair value of the currency uh, is close to the fair value as much as possible over a long period of time, right. right? So that the economic activity is not substantially impacted either ways uh, because of that. Understood. Uh, one last question in this uh, in this theme, and then we'll move to some other theme, Neeraj, which is the central banks doing these interventions. Does this have any uh, you know, second order impact on the economy around let us say interest rates or inflation, etc. Yeah. Or it does. I mean, all of these economic variables are very interrelated. Let me give you an example of inflation and exchange rate, right? If your exchange rate is, if let us say your currency is weakening, the cost of the imports is going up. And as the cost, cost of the imports are going up, 
uh, and if you are actually using a lot of imports for domestic consumption, there will be an impact on domestic on inflation, inflation yep. because of the weakening currency, right? And if you are a central bank who is very focused on uh, domestic inflation, your inflation targeting central bank, then what, you, what will happen is you will be forced to raise your interest rates to tackle this inflation, which in some senses can be an imported inflation, right? So all these variables tend to get interactive, they, they tend to interact with each other. But in general, I think what the central banks like to do is have a very domestic driven uh, interest rate um, sort of management strategy and exchange rate management strategy in line with what the domestic objective is to make sure that exchange rates are aligned with the economic fundamentals over a period of time. Great, very helpful. We move tracks a little bit, uh, Neeraj, around uh, currency crises. There have been many. Uh, we had our own in 1992. 1992, yes. Uh, there was a 99 South Asian, uh, Southeast Asian uh, uh, crisis. Uh, there was one in Argentina, Turkish Lira kind of went through its own version, uh, Russian currency, uh, they defaulted and they had a crisis. So just help us understand first like what is this currency crisis and subsequently let's talk a little bit about the 92 episode uh, that we had and what we learned from it and what has changed subsequently. Yeah, so uh, currency crisis in general, I mean basis the discussion that we had is very easy to see that if you have a if you have an economic system which is very dependent upon large amount of imports and you're not producing a lot of the stuff that you're consuming but you're dependent upon others other countries to actually import it you will need a lot of foreign exchange reserves right to be able to do those imports right and if you don't have those foreign exchange reserves you will have a very steadily depreciating currency because you're just importing you're not exporting so value of the currency will keep on depreciating right now there can be externalities which can accelerate the space of depreciation you know market can lose confidence on the fact that uh, you know the fact that you're just importing and you don't have any uh, foreign exchange earnings right this in some senses is the core of a currency crisis so for whatever reason uh, basically there is a large exodus of uh, money from the country and that results in a, let's say, a crash in the value of that foreign exchange of that country, which subsequently then means that imports become you Very know, prohibitively expensive. expensive. Right. And, you know, there is then hence no uh, food to eat or, you know, yeah. petrol to fill and yeah. so on and so forth. And that results in a more catastrophic social uh, disorder. Right. Basically. There's also an issue of confidence here, right? Currency crises are, they, they call it a crisis because there's something that has changed about the market's confidence. Correct. Right? So, for example, if you're a large importer, uh, as long as you have enough reserves, as long as the central bank has enough reserves um, and the market has the confidence that you can continue to pay for those imports through the reserves, no, no crisis, issues. no yeah. issues, right? It's only when the market loses the confidence in the fact that you have a lot of imports, you are dependent upon imports, something has happened to your exports, you are not able to supply as much exports as possible uh, and hence uh, there is a sharp mismatch in the demand and supply and the central bank does not have enough reserves to balance the demand and supply which causes a crisis of confidence, right? right? So, uh, all, I mean, the, the, the circumstances can be very different, uh, trigger points can be very different, but if you actually strip away the idiosyncrasies and you get down to the basics of it, you will realize that ultimately it's all about, you know, net demand and supply and ability of the central bank to stabilize the economy. So, let's go to 92. Yeah, so 92 is the same story for us. We were very import dependent. Uh, you know, if you remember late 80s, uh, India used to have, or right from mid 70s to 80s, India used to have this inward looking policy, right? We had this whole concept of export, uh, sorry, import substitution. Uh, as an economy, we were not engaging with the rest of the world as much. We were not exporting as much, right? Uh, but we did have imports. Oil was still required for imports, gold was still being imported. So we reached a stage of point where our imports were far higher than our exports. And there was a steady depletion in the foreign exchange reserves that the central bank had. 
right? And we reached a stage in point where we had very, very little reserves left. And that's where the crisis, con the, the confidence of crisis started, right? If I remember uh, right, there were some 18 days of reserves left at one point. That's in time right. Very, very small. I don't exactly remember the number, but it was a very small amount of reserves. And part of those reserves were in gold. Right. And there was this whole story about how we had to physically move our gold and pledge it yeah. to raise some you know, uh, dollars to pay for our imports. Yeah. So that crisis actually created, a, it was a wake-up call. Uh, it triggered uh, a very uh, strong uh, economic reform process in the early 90s, deregulation, focus on exports, creating a domestic manufacturing system which is internationally competitive, right? And then luckily in mid-90s, we had this whole uh, software process, exports yeah. A story that kind of started. We became a hub for international, you know, IT investment and IT exports, uh, and then the story changed from there. But the core is that today, and today we have almost 600 billion dollars in reserves, which means that over a period of time, uh, you know, we have uh, more inflows than outflows, and the central bank has accumulated these inflows. So there's been a dramatic reversal in the last 20, 30 years of uh, story. But core of this is that. Uh, import versus exports, right? How much is our dependence on uh, external uh, goods and uh, services and how much are we producing locally and how much are we producing it for the rest of the world, right? Uh, therefore, whenever you have a currency crisis and it happened for us as well, typically you will see that the countries run to IMF uh, or World Bank for a short term loan uh, and one of the conditionalities that IMF actually puts on these kind of loans is to create a more competitive domestic uh, industry, right, for for export purposes. Right. And you know, this, uh, the fascination that uh, we have as a country with forex reserves and many other countries as well, is it linked to episodes like this or is it? Uh... I think it's a very well-founded fascination, let me put it this way. Right. Uh, if you go back to 1997 Asian financial crisis, uh, the uh, sort of prescription for the for the Western world, from the Western world, and the organizations such as IMF and World Bank was that you should have a very open current account. You should promote a lot of free flow of trade uh, across countries, uh, and exchange rate will adjust and manage Take itself. It itself. It's yeah. like any other economic variable. But post ninety seven crisis, I think what people learnt was that. Markets may not exactly behave the way you would want them to. There are excesses that happen they in an economy. In, in the Asian countries, in the 97, what happened was the exchange rate was very uh, elevated. In some sense, it was very, uh, the currencies were sort of over um, valued. And that led to a lot of borrowing binge by these countries. And when that borrowing binge stopped, and when the music stopped, there was a currency crisis. Um, so now, I think the current thinking is that given the volatility in the currency markets and given the fact that these volatilities can create crises of confidence, uh, having a good amount of reserves, particularly for developing economies such as India, is a must, right? Uh, so now no longer is the prescription to say that I have a fully open, fully uh, convertible currency. Uh, let the market take care of itself. No, I think there is an expectation that the central bank should make sure that there is adequate reserves available and in case there is a crisis or in case there is undue volatility, uh, you know, those those volatilities are managed. Right. So, I mean, there's a great point you made, uh, Neeraj, which is that the if you look at the South Asian crisis, basically that was driven by excessive indebtedness, which means that the economy is borrowed and they spent it for something that spending was not necessarily highly productive and the borrowing was very cheap. But something happened in the external environment and suddenly that cheap borrowing no longer was cheap. Uh, and then uh, people said that, look, this country seems uh, over indebted and hence they pulled the money out. And our crisis was actually not of indebtedness, it was a trade related, like we were borrowing, yeah. uh, we were kind of buying, uh, importing far more than we were spending. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you if you if you juxtapose it with what South Asian countries did, I think they there was a debt, there was indebtedness, right? But if you take if if you create indebtedness, if you take on debt, 
to create capacity, production capacity, which then turns into an export revenue for you, then you are effectively paying for it for Absolutely. that indebtedness, yes. right? It's only when that doesn't happen, then, then there is an issue that whether the debt that has been taken is, from a foreign exchange standpoint, productive enough. Correct. Right? And while at an individual company level, it, the equation may be different, but you have to look at it as an aggregate economy level. Is aggregate economy level, is our level of indebtedness something that we can sustain? Right? Which is why one of the parameters that was started to become focus post the Asian financial crisis was short term debt. Right. Right? The level of short term debt. How much of short term debt are you taking and how does it compare with, let's say, your exports? Right. Right? Uh, and and uh, or a short term debt as a percentage of GDP. What percentage of GDP is driven by the short term external debt? Right. The point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, at the end of the day, it's a currency market. Uh, it's a function of demand and supply. Uh, and if you are actually creating indebtedness, which is not going to result, so indebtedness is nothing but a future demand. Correct. Right? I'm borrowing from you. Using that foreign currency borrowings, I'm going to do something about it. And pay me back. But at some point in time and future, I have to pay you back, Correct. which means that there is a future demand. Correct. So if I'm not creating future supply of that earnings, to match the future demand that I'm creating by way of indebtedness, there is going to be a problem. Absolutely. And it's, and it's two, two kind of reflections for me. One is that the foreign exchange crisis can be triggered by multiple things. It is not like one thing. But finally, it results in a crisis of confidence. It could be because imports are more than exports. It could be because of indebtedness. It could be because of some you know credit default or whatever, right? Like it could be of many, many things, but results in crisis of confidence. and. So that's number one. Number two, we, as a country, we have to be very thoughtful of how much debt, external debt we are taking because that external debt, if it goes beyond a certain limit, could result in a, could result uh, in a crisis, crisis of, of confidence. confidence. Yeah. And that, uh, Neeraj, now brings me to 2012 and we had, uh, uh, you know, kind of, a, it was not a crisis, but we had a mini, uh, you know, uh, around, the, around the taper tantrum, a uh, little bit of a crisis. It will be great if you can just explain that and Subsequently, what the RBI did and how did kind of that work out? Yeah, so I think 2012-13 uh, episode, which is called Taper Tantrum, uh, is a very classic episode of saying that how the crisis, conf the confidence of, uh, sorry, of the crisis of confidence can start impacting currency markets and economic activity. So obviously, uh, that was the time when Fed started talking about unwinding its QE for the first time post-global financial crisis. Right. And there was this worry that certain countries who had very large current account deficits who were not getting enough capital account flows could actually be significantly impacted, right, as the Fed started unwinding its overall quantitative easing program. Because, uh, because the thinking was that uh, if I'm an investor and uh, I have, let's say, India versus the US, US is raising rates and India is kind of, I don't have great confidence. So I will take money out of India and put it into the... Yeah. So uh, it is basically that as, you know, Fed policy is reverse, yeah. you will have... So, you know, think about this. If we have a very large current account deficit... Right. And we are funding that current account deficit by capital flows... Yes. Which are effectively hot money. Yes. Right? Either they are equity capital flows which are hot money or they are debt capital flows you are in a very slippery slope. Correct. Because if those capital flows were not to happen, if you were not, get, were not to get those, those monies in, how will you fund your current account yes. deficit, right? So therefore, we were at that situation where we had a large current account deficit and we were very dependent upon equity kind of, you know, uh, FPI, uh, equity flows and fixed income flows. So the worry was that as Fed tightens, these flows will reverse and we will not get enough liquidity to manage our current account deficit. Right. Obviously, it was a crisis of confidence. Underlying situation was not that bad, but market was worried. In fact, Indian rupee was a part of a set of five currencies which were called fragile five. Fragile five, yes. Right. So the immediate action that the that was taken was basically to stabilize the markets. And typically, stabilization of markets requires creating 
capital flows, which we did by doing what was called IRB bonds, right? In resurgent India bonds, if you remember at that time. Some money was raised by way of those bonds, which were then swapped into INR. And for swap, uh, some incentives were given to the banks, uh, domestic banks as well as foreign banks. Uh, you know, we also basically raised the interest rates quite dramatically at that point in time. In fact, short term interest rates went up to as high as 10% uh, in the wake of 2013 episode, which basically made the cost of uh, carrying dollars expensive. Yep. Right? Uh, so that you know, if you're an exporter, you have dollars. If you hold those dollars abroad, uh, it will be very expensive. So because the rupee is giving you that much more much better more interest rates, right? So you are incentivized to sell those dollars faster and bring, yeah, them, bring in, them, right? Yep. Uh, so measures like this kind of stabilized, and in general, I think the markets also stabilized. The QE was not as badly, uh, rather, it was not as. Uh, sharply unwound as people worried about it. Also, there was a special scheme for NRIs to uh, bring in the uh, FDs. Uh, yeah, so that's what I said that the res this resurgent India bonds and the NRI scheme that right. we did, right, right. Uh, which was basically to uh, attract capital flows, right, patriotic capital flows, as I would call it, right, uh, to help stabilize the currency, right. So, Neeraj, that was the taper tantrum episode. Now, almost a decade has passed since. Uh, and actually, you know, uh, at that point, the Fed was threatening to uh, raise interest rates and stop the QE, etc. They didn't actually follow on through that much. But if you think about the last, let's say, 12, 18 months, the Fed has actually raised interest rates by 500 basis points. Uh, QE has been kind of, now it's become QT. And if you think about it, the Forex, our exchange rate hasn't kind of done that much, right? It's not moved, moved that much. So what has changed uh, in this last 10 years? Yeah, so I think over the last 10 years, if you see first and foremost, our, uh, there has been a steady and significant increase in our foreign exchange reserves, right? Uh, we reached almost to $600 billion. We've been holding on there at around $600 billion uh, in foreign exchange reserves, which basically gives Reserve Bank a lot of ammunition to intervene in the markets if there is excessive volatility or any such issue of confidence crisis, uh, you know, those kind of those kind of matters. That itself is a bit of a uh, stabilizing factor, so to say. Uh, also, our underlying dynamics have also changed, right? Uh, there has been a fairly good growth in our uh, invisibles exports, the software exports and the services exports, right? Uh, our current account has remained very well behaved. Uh, it's been in the region of one and a half to say two and a half percent. Uh, of GDP, which is very, very manageable. We have been recipient of good amount of FDI and FPI flows, right, uh, over, the, over the last uh, few years. So all of these have basically contributed to a sense that our external account, as we call it, whether it's capital account, current account, you know, all of these are in a good shape. Uh, fundamentally, as an economy, we have been doing well. Uh, we've been growing now. We, this year, we're going to be one of the fastest growing economies in the world. So, and the fact that if things were to go wrong, there is enough reserves that Reserve Bank has, which it can use to stabilize the market. So, all of these factors have come together to give market this confidence that we don't need to necessarily, um, uh, or rather, we, we may not be as badly impacted by this reversal in monetary policy that's happened in the, in the West. Our inflation has remained very well behaved. Mm. Right, uh, as we have transitioned. Remember, we've transitioned to a inflation targeting Mid central yeah. bank somewhere in 2014-15. Right, uh, over the last seven eight years, as we've transitioned to become an inflation targeting country, uh, our monetary policy has worked effectively to make sure that inflation has stayed in a very uh, well-behaved narrow narrow band. Right, so all of these factors have come together in some senses to give the external investors this confidence that India remains one of the better managed economies uh, despite the sharp reversal in monetary policy. Great. Thanks a lot, Neeraj, uh, for that, uh, for those perspectives. Uh, just to, again, kind of bring all of this together, uh, we spoke about uh, different types of exchange rate regimes, freely floating to fully pegged and managed currencies in between, and how central banks uh, do the management. Uh, also the impact it has on economies and I think kind of the big takeaway for me is that 
uh, at the end of the day you can kind of you know do some short term things but if you move one metric something else will move in the other way and so your ability to kind of manage this is only only that much so hence central banks mostly focus on managing volatility versus uh, you know managing the levels uh, so uh, they will let uh, the the exchange rate get to the level that is quote unquote right uh, but manage the volatility and the space at which it goes down and due to that we spoke about all the currency crises which are essentially at the end of the day a crisis of confidence could emerge from multiple factors and which is why it is so critical to have a uh, strong kind of management of the domestic economy itself right so that you are keeping your current account in check as well as your indebtedness in check also we spoke about how uh, how the rbi in particular has managed through uh, through the taper tantrum and the last 10 years and how reserves are so important so uh, fantastic conversation thanks a lot neeraj for taking Thank out you. your time and uh, uh, wish you a great day Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Thank you for listening into this episode of Open Dialogue. I hope you enjoyed this as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. We are overwhelmed by the response that we've received and really look forward to your comments and feedback. Do like and subscribe to our channel to keep track of new episodes that are coming through. Thank you.